What's up guys? So we'll kick off the series today with an interesting class of stochastic processes called Markov chains. As you will see, despite the simple structure of the model class, it still presents a versatile modeling tool for analyzing real world processes. And indeed, some of the statistical results we will be driving will become very useful later on when we actually conduct inference. Okay. Um, so for this video, I'll just cover some of the basics of probability models for Markov chains. So first we'll look at what a chain is, then we'll look at the so-called Markov property, uh, and then we'll describe an appropriate probability model, which will set the stage for everything that follows. Okay, so let's jump in. Right, so recall that we can distinguish processes in terms of the nature of their state space, which we denote cal u, and the time index set, which we denote cal i. Now, if we assume that both the time index set and the state space are discrete, then the resulting stochastic process may be referred to as a chain. So for example, if we set the time index set to be the set of natural numbers and assume a discrete state space with say three states, uh, then a trajectory for such a process will assume a sequence of values drawn from one of the three possible states um, at discrete points in time. Okay? So if we plot a trajectory of such a process as coordinates in a figure with the time index set on the x-axis, and the uh, state space on the y-axis, um, we connect those coordinates using line segments, um, then the chain metaphor should become clear. Okay. Now, uh, first little thing to note here is, is that the labeling of the state space of the chain is somewhat arbitrary. The labels need not actually represent numbers. Okay. Labeling them with natural numbers is mostly useful for notational purposes. And indeed, the actual states may correspond to some property or state of the system that we're actually trying to model. So for example, to be on off on a switch. It could be alive, sick, dead in a mortality model. Uh, in credit risk, it could correspond to ratings. So double AA, A, triple A, uh, whatever. Um, in hidden Markov models, this is a probably different class of stochastic processes. Um, they can even correspond to a configuration of parameters for a traditional statistical model. Okay. So, but whatever the case, uh, if we assume that there's a discrete time index and a discrete state space, we may refer to such sequences as being a chain. Cool. So that gives us chains, but what about Markov chains? Well, if we consider a discrete time, discrete state process, X sub S, um, such that S is an element of the natural numbers, such a process is said to be a Markov chain. If for all elements S in the naturals, it satisfies the so-called Markov property. Okay. And that is that the distribution of the state of the process at time S plus one, given the state of the process at time S, is the same as the distribution of the state of the process at time S plus one, conditional upon its entire history, up to and including time S. Okay. So that is the distribution of the random variable X sub S plus one depends only on the state of the process at time S. So X sub S, uh, regardless of what its history was prior to time S. Okay, another way to articulate this would be to say that the future depends on the past only through the present. So that's another phrase I've borrowed from a book. Um, now, at first glance, this may seem like a very restrictive assumption to impose upon a model process. But as we'll see later, it is possible to allow for higher order statistical dependencies in the time domain uh, by simply adding more states. And the mathematical machinery that we'll be deriving um, under the present set of assumptions may still be used to analyze such processes, albeit with some implications for the characterization of the behavior of such a process. Um, but we'll cover more on that later. Okay, and that gives us a uh, Markov chain, right? So we have a chain, uh, the Markov property, Markov chain. Right, so before we continue characterizing Markov chains in terms of a probability model, we need to clear up some terminology. Okay, so if we consider two pairs of states, say i and j in Cal U, then we define the concept of transition as being the process is said to transition from state i to state j, t steps later, if x sub s is equal to i, so the process is in state i at time s, and t steps later, uh, the process is in state j, so x sub s plus t equals j. Okay, alternatively, if the process is in state i at time s and revisits that state t steps later, 
uh, then we refer to it as t step return to state i. Okay. Um, now this may seem a bit on the nose, but as you'll see later, distinguishing between these types of behavior or events will be useful for characterizing the behavior of Markov chains. Okay, so it is nevertheless important. Right, so in order to formulate a probability model for a Markov chain, so that is a statistical model which describes how the process evolves over time, uh, probabilistically, then we make use of these so-called transition probabilities. So that is, we denote the t-step transition probabilities of a discrete process moving from state i at time s to state j t-steps later simply by gamma sub ij arguments st. Okay? And we set that equal to the probability that the process is in state j at time s plus t given that it was in state i at time s. Okay? And that should hold for all pairs i and j in Cal U, and for all time steps greater than or equal to naught. Okay. So uh, for what follows, um, it's useful to think of S here as being a reference point in time uh, from which we evaluate the probability, and T as the number of discrete steps forward in time from that reference point. Okay. Now, because we characterize probabilities for all pairs i and j, where i and j are drawn from the same set, um, it is useful to collate these probabilities into a square matrix. So this is the so-called t-step transition probability matrix, which we will simply denote uppercase gamma uh, arguments s, comma t, which is just a matrix where the ijth element is the ijth t-step transition probability, which we've just defined. Okay, so what this means is that each row of this matrix thus represents the distribution of the state of the process, t steps later, conditional on being in a state corresponding to the row index at time s, the reference point in time. Okay, so our probability model for Markov chains uh, is described using transition probability matrices. Okay, so that's simple enough, but there's one little subtlety we need to get out of the way before we can continue on to some more interesting things. Okay, so obviously these transition probabilities vary as the transition horizon T changes. So that is, uh, the probability of occupying a particular state starting from a known position at the reference point in time S uh, will change as the transition horizon T changes. Okay, that much is obvious. But also, as we've defined it here, um, these transition probabilities may change with respect to the reference point in time s. Okay. Um, now, if this is the case, such a process is said to be a time inhomogeneous process. Okay, so to see what this is, consider a process with a one-step transition probability matrix, which assumes one set of values when the reference point in time is even, and another set of values when the reference point in time is odd. Okay. Clearly here, the reference point matters, right? And the transition probability matrix, which describes the model, uh, will change depending on where you are in time, and it'll cycle between two configurations. So clearly this is a time inhomogeneous process. If, however, your transition probability matrix does not change with respect to time, it is said to be time homogeneous, okay? Now in the case of a time homogeneous Markov chain, the reference point becomes somewhat redundant, and we can drop it from our notation, right? So we retain only the T, and our model is described in terms of a T-step transition probability matrix minus the S index, and uh, we simply denote it as uppercase gamma T. Okay. Now, for our purposes, unless stated otherwise, we will impose the assumption of time homogeneity as another assumption on our probability model. And obviously, one needs to check whether this is a valid assumption both against expert knowledge in the problem that you're working on, but also empirically when you're doing model checking and validation, right? Also, as usual, uh, one of the consequences of imposing another assumption on the model class is that it simplifies the mathematics of the analysis somewhat. And indeed, as you will see, when we impose time homogeneity on the process, once we have the one-step transition probability matrix, it in a sense tells us almost everything we need to know about the process. So that is, we can calculate useful statistical objects such as the t-step transition probability matrices, 
Uh, we can calculate stationary distributions, we can calculate first passage time distributions, and we can even characterize the behavior of the chain by simply drawing directed transition graph. Right, so that concludes the concept of the probability model as it pertains to Markov chains. So we start out with a simple chain. We then impose the Markov property, which gives us a Markov chain. And we can describe that Markov chain using a collection of probabilities. We collate those in a so-called transition probability matrix, um, which then describes the process. If we further impose the assumption of time homogeneity, um, that simplifies the description even further because we can describe the process at the hand of a single transition matrix. Okay, And as it happens, that also simplifies the mathematics sum. Okay. Right, so um, that concludes it for today. Uh, I'll check you in the next one.